The world is in a state of political turmoil with the sea and waves roaring. In Britain, the Parliament has been forced by the courts to reopen after being shut down by the Prime Minister. It is less than a month until the October 31st deadline for Brexit, and there is no clear path out of Europe yet. In America, the President is under constant attack, threatened by impeachment by the Liberal left who hate him and his policies with virulent hatred. In Israel, the country is divided down the middle between secular and religious parties, and the formation of a government is looking unlikely, possibly forcing a third election in the same year. In Canada, with a general election one week away, the Conservative Prime Ministerial candidate is having his character assassinated for issues such as not marching for gay pride. In the midst of all of this, this past week was Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and next week is Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. The week following is Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. These are some of the holy days outlined under the Law of Moses, which are observed by the Jewish people today. Leading up to the celebration of Rosh Hashanah is Selhot. This year, the event saw tens of thousands of Jews congregate at the Western Wall and engage in joint prayer. Selhot simply means prayers. It is interesting to see such a large congregation of Jews gathering at this time to engage in prayer. According to one Jewish website, Selhot prayers are described as ways. We sense an extraordinary nature of the prayer and turn introspectively within ourselves. The prayers themselves are pleas for mercy. The melodies are sad and longing. Properly chanted, they form the oration expressing the despair that accompanies separation from God and the desire to change and repent. It is a reflection on the name and character of God and his forgiving nature based on Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7, where we read, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Well, the Jews are coming together to pray the Selkot prayers. It's quite moving because of the words of the prophets. Consider the words of Malachi to Israel in chapter 4, verse 4, where we read, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with statutes and judgments. The fact that Jews are coming together and reciting prayers based on the Torah where God revealed himself to Moses and the people of Israel is fascinating. It is even more fascinating that they are doing this in Jerusalem in the tens of thousands. Listen to their voices. <laughs> famous and familiar prayers of this season is Avinu Melkenu, our Father, our King, consisting of 20 lines of entreaties asking God to forgive our sins, to help us achieve repentance for our transgressions, to remember us favorably, and so on. It concludes with a haunting congregational melody in which the community sings, Our Father, our King, graciously answer us, although we are without merit. Deal with us charitably and lovingly save us. What is worthy of note is what God says of his people in the prophecy of Zechariah, chapter 13, verses 7 to 9. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and smite the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts thereof shall be cut off and die, but a third shall be left therein, and I will bring that third through the fire, and will refine him as silver is refined, and try him as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Well, the context of this passage is the scattering of the sheep when the shepherd is smitten. 
We know the shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, was smitten around 33 AD, and the sheep were scattered in AD 17, and since that time have been going through the furnace of affliction. This is spoken of in Isaiah 48 verses 9 to 11. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory to another. Isaiah 48, verses 9 to 11. The people of Israel have certainly been in the furnace of affliction for the past 2,000 years, yet as both Isaiah and Zechariah indicate, they will be brought through the fire and refined. The result of the refining process is, is that they will call upon my name, and I will hear them, says God, and reclaim them as his people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. This is an exciting concept that God has begun, the process of bringing his people back to himself as he promised throughout the prophets. As tens of thousands of Israelites come to Jerusalem to pray for forgiveness, our minds are reminded of this passage in Isaiah and other prophets and the redemption that is coming. We read in Isaiah 62 verse 10 to 12, Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, Gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Well, Zion's Savior is coming, and when he does come, they will recognize him at the moment of crisis, as we read in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 9 to 10. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look on me whom they have pierced, and shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And they will finally recognize him, as we read in chapter 13, verse 6. One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. It is at an end of a long period of desolation that Israel will welcome their Messiah after a long period of rejecting him, according to the word of the Lord himself. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee like children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Well, Israel's house has been left desolate for two thousand years. And at the end of that period, termed the times of the Gentiles, the house of Israel is being regathered, and eventually they will call the Lord Jesus blessed. The city of Jerusalem is central to this prophecy at the time of crisis. The prophet Joel records, For behold, in those days, and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations and parted my land. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. It was in 1967 that Israel again came in possession of Jerusalem, 2,300 years following the commencement of the 2,300-year prophecy given, by Daniel, given to Daniel by Gabriel, as we read in chapter 8 and verses 13 to 14 in the ESV. Then I heard an holy one speak, and another holy one said to one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said unto me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. So remarkably, the Jews can now gather in the holy city, to pray for the restoration of the temple and the coming of Messiah and their redemption. Following the prayers of repentance comes Rosh Hashanah, 
the Jewish New Year, which occurred on September 30th to October the 1st, Monday and Tuesday of this past week. The Jewish New Year is brought in by the blowing of trumpets, which is based on Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 to 24, where we read, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So as Jews met in Jerusalem, the ram's horn sounded out across the city. Why we find this so interesting is the change of circumstances that have allowed this event to take place in Jerusalem. For thousands of years, the Jews uttered a prayer at the end of the Passover Seder and at the prayer service ending Yom Kippur, Lashana Haba'ah Berushalayim, meaning next year in Jerusalem. This prayer encapsulates the desire of the Jews to return to the land and rebuild Jerusalem. The Jews have now returned to Jerusalem and are in possession of it, and many of them are in eager anticipation of the third temple being built and of Messiah's coming. Ten days following Rosh Hashanah is Yom Kippur. Yom is the Hebrew word day, and Kippur means covering, and has the same root word for the kippah, or the small round head covering worn by Jewish men after rabbinical tradition, called a yarmulke in Yiddish. It isn't actually a biblical commandment. Well, this day of covering reminds the Israelite of mankind's need to be covered in order to come before God, just like God provided coverings for Adam and Eve at the beginning of creation. We read in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 27 to 29, Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it shall be that shall not be afflicted in the same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Well, this occurs October 8th and 9th, or Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. It is not possible for proper observance on Yom Kippur to be held at this time as is required an offering made by fire. This offering was to be made by the high priest, as we read in Leviticus chapter 30, chapter 16, sorry, in verses 30 to 33. For on the day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. Israel today is in a similar predicament as they were in the days of the prophet Azariah. We read in Second Chronicles 15 verses 1 to 4, The Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded, And he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you, while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel hath been without a true God, without a teaching priest, without a law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord their God of Israel, and sought him, he was found of them. Well, what would change the predicament was if they turned to him and sought him. Then God would again answer them. This condition was to come on the people of Israel as Hosea prophesied in chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Well, we live in the very end of the days of the time when Israel is without a king, a prince or sacrifice. They are beginning to seek the Lord their God and soon will have Messiah revealed to them and the temple mount will be cleansed completely and restored. 
There will be a restoration of temple worship and sacrifice once again. Israel will call upon their God and he will hear them. We are witnesses of the commencement of that process. Israel is back in the land. More Jews are returning all the time. The times of the Gentiles have expired. The city of the great king has been restored to Jewish hands. The Jews are again calling upon their God, and he tells us he will hear again their prayers. May that day soon be when God will bring about the promises he has made to Abraham, which include the gospel message where all nations are blessed in him. May he answer the prayers of the Jewish people and redeem them through the Messiah. Then will Israel say, The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he has not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord, into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 118, verses 18 to 29. May the trumpet soon sound, that will bring David's son to Jerusalem. The trumpet sounding that will redeem both the nation of Israel and the saints. A trumpet that will also call back to life those who have died. As we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This trumpet sound will herald the Lord's return. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 to 17. For the Bible and the news, this has been Jonathan Bowen joining you.